Hi, we're working on um, flax. So once, come next spring, we've planted our, our seeds, and then you're going to have this. You're going to take this piece of equipment. This was called a flax break. It's something that the men would have made, uh, made early on as we were bringing down timbers for our cabins and so on. Stick this thing in the, in the flax break, and we bring this down on it like this hard enough to crack these stems. And the more you crack them, the better off you're going to be. So we've got that done. Then you're going to lay it out here in the meadow. And um, most years, about six weeks, it's going to be out there. This year, four weeks, you'd have been done. But you, you spread it out so that you can see grass underneath it. Once a week, you turn this stuff over. And uh, this was called do retting, R-E-T-T-I-N-G. It's a Gaelic term. It means to soften and rot. And so it's going to be out here, and it isn't going to be too long. It's going to start to stink to high heaven. Because for us, it's controlled composting. And you want this woody part to break down. And once it starts to break down, you've got to get it off before this, the fiber that's on the inside, goes with it. So our next step is to use this thing. It's a scutching knife. Dullest knife in the drawer. <coughs> now, we all had machetes. But if you took a machete to this, you're going to cut your fiber, and you didn't want to do that. So this was a wooden knife with a little bit of a rounded area to give you a little more working space. You put your plant down, had a board behind it so you could hide your fingers behind there and not crack your fingers with this thing. And then you brought this down along the plant, pushing it against the board, and that would rip the woody part off that has softened. So we have... This, uh, this is your scotch. This uh, now is about 18 months into our process. You've got your plant scotched, and then the final step that you're going to do to clean it up is to use these, your hackles or heckles. Blacksmith made nails driven through a board. Uh, this one is German uh, made because they wrap the board and the, uh, itself and, and around the outside with metal. That reinforced the board so that when you drove the nails in it, it wouldn't split out and you got a nicer hackling job with it. So you would have clamped this to something that you could pull against and you took a little bit of this fiber and you lashed it on those nails, pulled it back between the nails. The um, nails would remove the last of the woody part that might be in there. And there's also some really fuzzy material that was called toe. And you didn't want that in your, fire, in your clothing. It would make for lumpy cloth. Mm -hmm. it, but you did want it for your fire starter. And a lot of folks would even go so far as to, um, to toast it so that it, it was even more flammable. So when you dropped a spark from your steel and flint on it, it's going to start right away. So that was your Zippo lighter, 1776 style. Once you had that done, now we can at least take some of the fiber and begin to, to spin with it. You're going to tie it to the distaff of the wheel. And I'm going to pull a little fiber off of here and lay it up next to what's coming off of the spindle. I'm going to get it wet. The reason I get it wet, uh, and I just use water, is that flax has a material called pectin, the same thing that you can use to thicken jelly. Well, it's got pectin in it. And it's kind of a, a waxy substance. But once it gets activated, it will make your uh, yarn be smoother. So I'm going to start my wheel. The wheel's going to give me twist and tug. The twist is going to move down here to my fingers, and the spinning is always in your hand. Never. Um, the wheel, it, it's called a spinning wheel. It cannot spin. It's what your fingers feel and what you've taught your brain that you're looking for. Um, so, to me, it's, it's kind of like learning to drive standard. The first couple times, it's a bit of a nightmare. Mm -hmm. And then you get the process. So, as you spun your flax, and it comes up here onto the bobbin, now it's linen. And linen uh, is a good fiber. It's the second strongest <coughs> fiber in uh, plant fiber that we use and is three times stronger wet than dry. So 
it, it's, it's a good fiber. It breathes well in the summer, so on. The problem with it is it's extremely combustible. It'll start to burn right now. And we were all working around open fire. So if wind caught our skirt and whipped it around there, you could be a candle real quick. We knew the answer to that problem. It's this, Lindsay Woolsey. It's 50% uh, linen, 50% wool. You combine the two on the loom when you were doing this, or weaving, and uh, the linen wouldn't let the wool shrink. And the wool wouldn't let the linen burn. So those two together, it's a, a safety thing for sheep, but if you have at least 50% wool in your clothing, it'll smolder a little bit before it, it'll go into flame, if it ever goes into flame. Uh, so that's what we wanted. Well, we, I said when we first started this that we didn't bring small animals back here because there was no place to keep them safe. By 1780, um, we know that there were sheep present. And so you would have been spinning on a wheel like this. This is a much older style wheel than that one is. Uh, this one's well known to have existed all the way back in the early 1300s in Europe. And um, when you spun with this, instead of treadling like I could with that one, I'm going to run it with my right hand while all the spinning is in my left. That makes it absolutely imperative that your prep of the wool is, is good or this can be a nightmare. I'm going to walk this off. Come on, get up there. Thank you. Walk it onto the bobbin. And I'm ready to go again. The average woman spinning with a wheel like this walked 20 miles a year back and forth beside this thing. So needless to say, when you had a little girl, you were not upset about that because about the time she's five, she begins to learn, seriously begins to learn to spin. And by the time she's nine, she's got this whole process done. Mm -hmm. So if we've got our, our wool here and we've got linen here, we're going to make that material. It would be brought over here and put on this, the loom. I'm sorry I can't weave today. The loom and I are having a discussion and it's winning. <laughs> <coughs> we're having to put a little bit of repair on him. Um, but if we're going to do our linen, it's going to be this way on the loom, the warp threads. Uh, it has to be under a lot of tension, and this will not um, take, the wool will take tension. So this is, that's got a, a linen has to be that, that direction. Uh, in the early days, there would have been one loom for the community. Timbers for it would have come down when they brought the timbers down to make the fort. It would have been over here in the blockhouse. There's not enough room in these one-room wonders that we have for cabins over here to have a family and one of these sitting in there. And you truly did not need one of these right away. If you're only growing a quarter acre of flax a year, you have no sheep, there's no need for a woman to have something this big in her house. You wait until our flax production has increased and what you really want to be doing is, is um, <coughs> growing a quarter acre for each member of your family. So once you're producing more flax and you've got sheep, then you're going to need a loom. But right now, you don't. The, um, the way this would have been worked out is that one woman, the fastest weaver, would have done the weaving for the community. So let's say I'm going to be that woman and uh, I'm the fastest weaver, so um, you're going to come to me, you have four daughters, and you have your flax spun up now. So you're going to bring yours to me, and I'm going to go to the loom, and I'm going to start to weave with this right away. And to allow me to spend every waking minute that I possibly can during my day working on this to get this fiber done for you, you're going to feed my family at your cook fire while I'm doing this then she's going to bring me hers because she's right behind you and breathing down your neck. I need to get mine in here. The idea being that we uh, wanted to have our cloth back and ready to sew, having sewn it by the middle of October, the end of the early, at the latest, to be sure that you had clothes ready to go before snow would fly. The pars we were looking for was two shirts, two pair of pants for a man, two dresses for a woman, hand-me-downs for the kids, but trying very hard to make sure each child had at least two outfits. Now, once in a while, those things didn't really work all that well. And then Mom had to figure out, okay, where where's something going to come for this one? 
child. Well, <clears throat> initially, with just a quarter acre of flax, there's no way you're going to have two shirts and two pair of pants for anybody. So you're still going to be using the buckskin clothing, a lot of it. But um, in due time, you will have enough material to work with. In these early days, the work that the men was doing was so unbelievably physically demanding that uh, their clothing usually would only last one year. It might have disintegrated before the year is out. And there's plenty of stories of men wearing uh, breech cloth and leggings at the end of the summer and hoping we're getting the weaving done before snow's going to fly. Mm -hmm. So that was some of what we would have been uh, dealing with. If a woman has two dresses one year, not that she doesn't work hard because she surely does, but you're not going to be something like the draft animal because if you didn't have a workhorse and you needed something heavy moved, a couple men get together, you put ropes around your shoulders and you start pulling whatever it is you need to move. Well, that's going to tear up your clothes. So uh, even with buckskin, theirs is going to go. The woman, you're not going to do that. You have other things you'll do, but uh, your clothing won't take the beating. So you very well may say, all right, I had two dresses last year. But I got my buckskin, so I'm all right this year. I can use my yardage for the kids. Uh, as time progressed and we were growing more and more flax, if you can think of anything that's in your house today that um, uh, <clears throat> you know <clears throat> pardon me, that the settlers had, I'd say sheets and towels, pillowcases, tablecloths, if you knew they had something, they could very well be uh, making or you would be making that for your family in this time period. Uh, just to give you an idea, a set of sheets were expected to last at least 100 years. And I can remember in my grandmother's house, linen off of here woven on this type sheets. They were like battleship siding. One folded up was about this thick. So heavy you could hardly open the drawer that they were in. Why don't we use this? Too heavy. Well, you know, now I can look back and understand. My grandmother was under, was under five feet tall. She couldn't have lifted those sheets over a line if she wanted to use them. But um, I kind of wish now we hadn't thrown those sheets out when we broke up the housekeeping. It would have been nice to have them and look back at them. But they're gone. Um, but if they, you expected them to last 100 years, <laughs> nothing you buy today is going to last 100 oh, no. years. <laughs> I, I bought some... At one time I ran a, a, our house as a bed and breakfast and I bought a thousand thread Egyptian cotton mm -hmm. sheets for the beds. I couldn't get more than about seven years out of them. And Can I ask a question? Sure, sure. Is, is this time period too early for like flower sack or Oh yes, sack? yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, too Because we did a lot of Oh, yeah. And I pulls out flowers. I was dressed in a lot of flower sacks yeah. when I was a little one. But uh, yeah, it's too early for that. Okay. How much snow would you guys have got here? Probably about what we do now. Yes, which, uh, which is, well, so, uh, we're in the upper Michigan, so uh, we already have snow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I lived in Michigan for about 10 years, I yeah. understand that. Uh, no, you, we don't get winter like oh, Michigan okay. gets winter. Uh, you won't find a school bus here <laughs> with uh, sand blasters on the wheels, which ours, ours had. But, um, most years, if we get one to two inches of snow, very likely it is melted by 10, 11 o'clock the next morning. Okay. The big thing we get that is bad for us is ice. And at least once a year, we will get an ice storm that's really bad. So um, actually, I would rather drive in snow than ice, that's for sure. Uh, one more question, then I'll give on. <laughs> the flax that you grew, was it only for fabric, or did they have some other use for flax? I think it was mostly only for, for clothing. There wasn't that much. Now, I do know that, and I, I've had folks asking me about flax being used for candle wicking. Uh, or um, cow feet or? No, 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 okay. no. The only thing that you would have used is the, 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 the woody part that got mushy. You'd have thrown that out and the okay. pigs might have rooted through it or something of that sort, but no. Fabric. Um, it's, yeah. it's fabric. It's fabric, yeah. Now, the, it's not the same flax as what you see the scenes from it in um, in grocery stores today. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different creature. It's a cereal grain crop only. 
that turns yellow in the fall, you go through it with a combine, you take the seeds off, but those plants do not have any fiber in them mm -hmm. at, you know, Ooh. plant fiber in them at all. So you won't get any of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys have a good day. Enjoy yourselves. Thank you much.